Okay, say some things. Hello. Adventure. Love. Connection. Risk. Passion. Evolution. Play. Life. The Archetypal Tarot Podcast. Provocative mythology for the 21st century. This episode is a conversation about archetype and body image with Nicole Schnackenberg and Richard Cox. Nicole is a psychotherapist, yoga teacher, a director of the Yoga in Healthcare Alliance, a trustee of the Body Dysmorphic Disorder Foundation, and she is the author of False Bodies, True Selves, Moving Beyond Appearance-Focused Identity Struggles and Returning to the True Self. Richard is a student of non-dualism and runs groups and individual sessions exploring consciousness. He hosts a podcast looking at the intersection of spirituality and therapy. He's also developed a program called Unbreaking the Mirror to explore a consciousness-based approach to engaging with body image distress. And if that weren't enough, he's also a long-standing patron of this show. And here's our conversation about archetype and body image and so much more. Hello. Hello, Julian. Hi, Hi Julian. Hello, Nicole. Thank you guys so much for being on the show. I think this is a really great show to start our new year off with. I think it's a big time after New Year's. People are reflecting on things in their lives, maybe things that they want to find out about themselves, things that they want to change, and, and just the, the nature of change itself, because we've got a brand new year. So mm. I'm, I'm just chuffed that you guys are going to be on the, you're on the podcast for this. And uh, Richard, now you and I have known each other for, for a bit now, and you're a patron of the show. Thank you for that. Super excited to have you on. So you and Nicole have been working together for a while and a lot of what you're doing, better than that, why don't you just explain kind of an overview of what the two of you have been working on together with, with people? Okay, thank you, Julianne. Uh, this is actually one of my absolute favorite shows, so I'm delighted to be here. Oh. For the past <laughs> couple of years, <laughs> Nicole and I have been running an online support group looking at spiritual approaches, particularly to body image dissatisfactions, people who are deeply unhappy with their sense of physicality. We are more encompassing than that. We are, we are more widely inviting that. So people, for us, the core thing is the spirituality and the, the form of suffering that manifests into, and uh, the absence of that manifests into is a kind of secondary thing, but we are at the same time centered. We have been centered around body image and that's a monthly group. And we've also been like running a, I've been running a study for the past, uh, this year and um, looking at offering people one-to-one -one sessions around that. The idea being the, the idea we, we were both working on independently, uh, prior to meeting each other was that a lot of human suffering is a kind of, unanswered spirit, spiritual question, a kind of spiritual quest that isn't seen in that context. And what people are really asking underneath more superficial questions about how do I look? Is my appearance okay? Are deeper questions about, am I lovable? What really is the nature of a human being that makes us lovable? If my body is aging, if people have a paranoia about aging, that can mask deeper questions about I'm descending into death where the body is falling away. What meaning does does life itself have if it ends in death? So what we do is offer a platform where people can explore whatever's going on for them in that slightly deeper, more spiritual context. A lot of that isn't necessarily mythic. It's It can be more on the kind of Advaita or Zen, kind of pure looking into the consciousness center of one's being um, side of the spectrum. But also it can very much go into myth and look at how, how people understand each other through mythic archetypes and shape-shifting into things like witches and monsters and how these feelings within us express ourselves and the unloved, unknown shadow aspects, how they, how they present themselves. So that's a, a, an overview really of, of where we're at. Fertile ground there for sure. <laughs> and so Nicole, um, tell, us, tell us a little bit more about how you came to this and a little bit more about the programs that you and Richard are working together. I'd love to hear a bit more about your kind of story and what you're bringing to this. Thank you, thank you, Julianne. So I've come to this uh, line of work and this interest through my own personal experience. So I've got li lived experience of pinning my sense of identity and particularly my sense of unlovability onto my physical appearance. 
and that started in childhood really probably quite early childhood although I didn't have words for it at that time I didn't really understand what was happening um, but it was in the context of being born into a family that had experienced some trauma both on my mother and father's side and therefore being the eldest being a much longed for child and feeling that somehow um, I wasn't lovable as I was I suppose that there was there was quite a lot being processed and worked out through through me and the way I made sense of that was well perhaps um, I'm perhaps as I perceived it perhaps I'm being treated as the naughty girl or perhaps my um, sense of myself is, is, is of the bad person in the family because of the way I look um, because I couldn't really understand what what other aspect it might be because I was trying very hard to be good and doing very well at school and all the rest of it so I thought well it must be the way I look that's making me difficult to love so then that led to in my early teens beginning um, a struggle that ended up being diagnosed as anorexia and that led to some inpatient treatments and some outpatient experiences as well and whilst helpful especially things like a family therapy and um, art therapy and beginning to explore a little bit and unpick a little bit why I was starving myself um, still I came away from all of those experiences in terms of the medical model of addressing my distress with the sense of well um, you know I'm, I'm I am a bad person I am despicable in a sense but I just have to learn to live with it I have to push those feelings away those feelings of ugly, ugliness and low self-worth away and just get on with my life um, and I suppose that's what I did and I feel very sad to report that certainly in in the work that I do with other people that often that is the result if you like or at least part of the trajectory of people's experience that they they somehow pin their self-worth onto their appearance they play that out they realize that that kind of isn't going to get them anywhere very fast or very far and so they kind of push that down and try to just um, get on with life as best they can. But that underlying sense of worthlessness and unlovability remains. I guess at some point, um, I came to the realization that there was also another opportunity there, that I could live the rest of my life um, denying my sense of ugliness and denying my sense of unlovability and just kind of living with it. Or I could do the opposite, which is something I'd never tried and was terrified of, to be honest which was to turn around and face it and to kind of dive into that sense of ugliness and to be with that sense of unlovability and say, do you know what? You're welcome here. I will um, embrace you in a sense. And feeling like that would be the end of things, really thinking that that would probably send me mad. And then I connected with Richard and found that he was thinking about things and exploring things in a very similar way. And us deciding, look, let's, um, let's see how we can share this with people. Let's see if we can support people to go to those darkest places and see if there's some jewel, some gem to be found in, amongst those ashes, if you like. Brilliant. I mean, you're, you're essentially talking about the Jungian, what the Jungians call shadow work, where mm. you, you go deeply into those. Um, and it's, you know, don't go there by yourself. It's kind of like going into a bad neighborhood, take someone with you. Um, so I think it's just brilliant that the two of you um, have come together to do this work. A quick question. So you have an online support group. You're, are you also doing presentations and working with people in, in person? I'm working with people in person online. We do do presentations whenever we're asked to. 
And I mentioned earlier, we've been running a study this year. So what prompted us to, to get the group going, just as Nicole was saying, we wanted to make, we noticed like great transformational effects for the better in our own lives mm -hmm. from engaging with life and our own sense of being from this perspective. It had opened up doors in our own minds and, and wider lives for us. And we wanted to, to make that more widely available. Um, but also it's a bit pioneering to it's not as other people have done it of course but it, it's something that's really emerging into the world in a lot of ways at the moment so we want to there is an exploratory aspect okay if we're looking at what's the potential for this we, we know what potential it had for us but what is the potential when it reaches other people who maybe at least to begin with aren't thinking this way okay and when we're, we're trying to at least open that possibility for them look you could look at what's going on for you in a different way so that with the group, what we started doing earlier in the year was um, Nicole and I um, worked on producing a study, which I then ran and did sessions of people to document before and after um, effects of if people have six sessions based around meditation, self-inquiry, looking within, posing philosophical questions to themselves, getting to the deeper questions, and also looking at things in terms of archetype and mythic image, what effect would that have on someone over that initial period? Would it open up a doorway for them that allowed them to then have a, have a kind of foundation to investigate their lives in a different way? Um, not that it would lead to a complete cure of whatever's going on for them, um, but it would, it would set them off on a hero's journey, if you like, because they would have the context to see what was going on as a hero's journey, as opposed to just the terrible thing that they were a victim of. Right. That's the, well, it's the victim's journey in many ways, archetypally. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. there's what happens to you and then there's what, what you do with it. How are your, what are your reactions to it? But I think uh, uh, what I'm hearing is a big part of, especially the initial value is, is, um, is that recontextualization that I think many, many people, because they're, they're unconscious or they're only partly conscious of, you know, early traumas. And I think that probably would be something that, that has to start in childhood or has to start mm -hmm. very, very early, early on, because it's, it's at a, you know, it will happen at a pre-rational place in your life. And that's typically, you know, you're a small child. Mm -hmm. um, you don't understand, you know, what actually is happening around you or to you, but you will, I think humans just naturally internalize things. If this is this, then that means I'm unlovable. And mm -hmm. that's, I mean, we are just so tender when we're, when we're young, we don't have, you know, unless we have brilliant people around us who are paying attention to us and reassuring us and, and, and really relating to us. And, you know, most, most parents are probably too busy, I think a lot of times and don't, you know, you can't get into the mind of a child, but if there's a certain kind of attention that you pay to, you know, watching children, what are they interested in? And again, you know, when you, clients who've had small children they want to know what the archetypes are in their child and I'm like well pay attention to the cartoons they love or to the mm -hmm. games and things that they like and that will you know bring forward sort of those ideas those archetypal shapes that either are internalized within them or they're dealing with and uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't imagine that it's I mean I think it's going to happen to every every kid there's going to be some difficulty um, that comes up whether it turns into a body image um, issue or not, but it is something to be worked with. That's language that I think I've used for years and years of of talking about trauma and issues. It's it's you make it more of a part of what you deal with in your life. You work with it versus you battle against it because yeah. you know a battle is going to end in death, right? <laughs> it's always so, and and in some cases that death can just be the the you know your inner monster. So um, I'm really interested in hearing about a little bit more about the process that you take with with clients, but also kind of the mythological. Their earlier conversation, we talked about the witch and the monster. In what ways are you kind of talking about these? Do you actually use stories? Do you use stories in your process? Or do you ask them to find stories that appeal to them or scare them? What does that look like? in working with story and mythology and archetypes with your clients. Nicole, I know you've written about this. Do you want to? Yeah. Um, well, I definitely, I completely agree with you, Julian, that it can be really interesting to look at what drew people in 
in their early childhood in terms of the fairy tales and the mythical creatures you know what was it um, that they were fascinated by and it was interesting to me to remember in my adulthood that I absolutely loved the story of the Snow Queen it was my favorite and I would read it again and again and again and I could remember the last part of the story but when I returned to it as an adult I was almost had the breath knocked out of me reading the first part um, because it was all about how the trolls had made this mirror and this mirror um, it it uh, it hid all the positive aspects but it highlighted all the so-called negative or difficult or disgusting aspects of the person and the trolls were so delighted with this mirror you know that, and how successful it was that they they decided to take it up into heaven to make total falls of the angels and on the, on their way up this mirror gets smashed into many many pieces and it falls down to earth and it falls into some human beings eyes and whoever's eyes it the pieces of mirror fall into so their eyes take on the characteristic of that mirror namely they can only see the the terrible and and the difficult aspects of other people and they lose sight of all those positive um parts and i yeah i just thought wow you know that's exactly what i've been doing in a sense i've kind of lost sight of all of the the lights within me all of the positive aspects and i'm only able to look into the mirror and see something abhorrent um and then also thinking to myself then you know what 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 is it that the trolls represent what is it that the mirror represents um why is it that from in my story in particular it came to be pinned on the mirror reflection and not something else um, and, and certainly when I'm working with people around this, I, I ask them to think about what stories drew them in and ask them to reflect on, firstly to go back to those stories because I think often the most pertinent points aren't necessarily the points we remember um, and maybe there's a protective factor in that. Um, but secondly, you know, what might that reveal about their current experiences? But also what might it reveal about the the possible reconceptualization of their experience so uh, uh, it also really resonated julianne when you were speaking about how childhood trauma is often pre-verbal by its very nature especially if it's e extremely early and therefore we don't necessarily have the words um, to put onto it but that somehow then that gets put into metaphor whether that be the metaphor of ugliness the metaphor of the witch or put into the metaphor of um something else and then how do we um, how do we respond to that metaphor and then somehow get to the pre-verbal experience through that metaphor? That's definitely something I'm really interested in exploring with people. Yeah, and it, it reminds me of, I'm a fan of, um, I, I enjoy reading a lot of the Jungian writers and James Hillman worked because mm -hmm. there's in, generally in psychology and I would say since probably the 60s, 50s onward, the trajectory around the, the wound of the inner child. Um, and then, it, you know, for, for a time, and I think we're almost sort of pulling out of this a little bit, but that psychology was all around the original wounds in the child. I don't think there was, James Hillman kind of presented a little bit of a backlash against that, but I think it was pretty well misunderstood. But, it, but essentially, it, you know, the, the idea of, oh, all of your problems are rooted in your childhood. And then, you know, kind of going out from that there's I think there were missing pieces in the on the mm. whole in psychology but what what Hillman was trying to say is those early childhood wounds the wounded child in us are also really really important because they are a doorway with which if you pass through them you work with work with it to what did that original wound also give you in terms of what it, what the gift? And he talked about um, his book called The Soul's Code, which essentially said, you know, it, these horrible, you know, you don't have to live the rest of your life as a victim of, I can't do this in my life because I was wounded as a child. And it all kind of comes back to, oh, horrible parents or whatever that sort of general idea was. He said, this is useful. This is mm -hmm. pointing your soul. These wounds needed to happen in order for you to go and, you know, basically live your soul's path to do what you did. And he cites many um, kind of amazing artists and thinkers and people who went on to do great things, but they probably wouldn't have had they not had that sort of original sin, that original wound um, where, where I really enjoy his philosophy because it, it, 
it no longer puts you as a victim. It moves you more towards it provides a trajectory to become the victorious, which is kind of the, lay, the way I language the two sides of the one archetype, victim to victorious. They really are one pattern. Mm -hmm. um, there's a pathology and a possibility essentially to those. So mm -hmm. it's, I think, really, really important. And I love hearing that the two of you are working around something, especially specifically around body image. Um, this day and age, I don't, there's like eras where you hear so much about, oh, well, we're really addressing this. And I think in the last five, 10 years, to me anyway, um, there's a lot of, oh, the gnashing of teeth with social media and how everybody has to look perfect in their photos. But but how to work with that. Like we know why it's happening because everyone wants to find that beautiful part of themselves and show it to everybody. But the underlying root of how desperate people are to do that is something that, that we haven't yet really gone back to readdress. And I think the work that the two of you guys are doing is, is a part of that. You know, is there, are you guys thinking at all? And this just occurred to me. So curveball. Um, <laughs> In terms of, are you working at all with people on any processes or exercises that they can do? I'm thinking of the selfie culture, you know, of, of, of actual, there's, I would imagine, mirror work, but anything around how people are presenting themselves to the world on social media. Is there a relationship to that aspect in your, in your work? Well, just to pick up on you were saying about the core wounds, I think... I'd be right in saying, Nicole, that we might conceptualize the core wound not so much as a bad event in childhood, but as a loss of connection with the true self. Okay, mm. this what you could conceptualize from a sort of perennial philosophy point of view of this infinite field of all loving, all beautiful consciousness in which all of us arise. We lose a sense of that and then become, we try to replicate it. We, we try to replicate that infinite beauty or to patch over it by having perfect selfies. Okay, and not accepting any kind of physical flaw. So I think it speaks to it speaks to the problem in that sense of um we haven't I think so much gone into a direct thing about selfies, although by the time this comes out, I'm looking to we have specifically done um, mirror gazing meditations, okay, for how the mirror can be um both something that's a, a terrible kind of victimizer of people and something you can feel a lot of misery inside. But again, you have this parallel to spiritual practices then there's a lot of spiritual practices involve mirror or eye gazing in some way so there is this this parallel and um certainly by the time this comes out i've been working on making some of the meditations more publicly available and, and they'll be up and out then of how how to have a transformative experience through mirror gazing how it can rather than being stuck in a superficial sense of self in the mirror it can be a gateway to that deeper sense then Right. So you're right. How do you deal with the ego spirituality? Um, and they, um, well, it's so funny. I think it's a question that I've not had large discussions around recently, but the, um, there was something that Michael Mead said about the ego has the keys to the ashram. And there is a certain set of, of spiritual teachings that are basically get rid of the ego you don't need it. The ego is edging God out and all of that belief. And um, I, I, my, myself, I mean, it was probably 12 years ago or more. I was like, yeah, get rid of the ego. And then, yeah, through life, I realized, yeah, you're not going to do that. And the, the, the working of the ego, like the, the pl there is a place for, for the ego. I don't know that, that life allows us to become egoless, to longer have that sort of self-reflective, how we think of ourselves, ego. Um, but the social media has made it far more uh, difficult to feel good about yourself because of, you know, social media brings the ego to the fore. And, and what I've, in a conversation I had somewhat recently, this is where I, I, I get confused myself, I'll, I'll admit, that the spiritual, that feeling that you get when you see yourself really, really well presented in a photo, just like, ah. Oh. And I, I question for myself and in conversations with other people is, am I seeing what's really, really true? Am I satisfying the ego to get it to step out of the way in order to get to the truth of the beauty of who I am? You know what I'm saying? Sort of like, mm. I, 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 it's like I have to satisfy the ego to get to this thing. But then any other part of the day when I'm not, my, my ego is engaged in 
telling me I don't look good. You know, that, that's what's the question of the truth. Like that best picture I've ever seen of myself, that's the real truth. That's the spiritual truth that satisfies the ego. And I think, um, I think, Julianne, a lot of this is really rooted in, again, things that are very deep and that we would have learned very, very early on um, in our life in this body. So this idea that when we look at a selfie or we put a selfie up on Facebook or whatever it is, and it seems to be flawless and, and good, whatever that is, right. um, and we're pleased with it and other people are pleased with it, then that somehow maps onto, on a very perhaps unconscious level, that we must therefore be good and pure, um, which is, of course, what our soul knows itself to be in any case, which is perhaps why we strive after it, which again maps onto all these stories in childhood where the princess is flawless and beautiful and the, the, the monster, the witch, the troll is covered in warts and, and is bent over and has green skin and, um, and that equates with evil. So there's something very deep in the sense of, you know, if there's something there that seems to be flawed, you know, even the, um, you know, the very classic uh, baddie with the scar on his face, you know, um, you know, if there's something there that seems to be suggesting a physical flaw, then that, then that must mean that there's something not quite right about my deeper self. Whereas our soul knows our true self to be completely um, pure and flawless, totally regardless of the appearance. So there's that real struggle, I think, with people. And there's that kind of dichotomy and that, that tangential understanding that we are not our appearance and, and something like a scar or a blemish or whatever it might be doesn't mean we're bad people. Side by side with this very deep sense that we've been fed perhaps for very many years that perhaps it does suggest that we're bad if that photograph of us isn't good. And that's quite hard to unpick, I think. I think you see this emerging as a cultural narrative. I, I, I get out of my depth when I talk about cultural narratives because it's very <laughs> easy to make predictions about the world that are completely wrong. But when you see films like Shrek coming out, okay, which sort of retell the Beauty and the Beast story, um, but where the, Fiona transforms into the ogre at the end, or you see witches being transformed i think the first show was bewitched that did it but then they become good witches essentially emerge into society more i think there's a deeper current there you see the same thing with vampire mythology the vampires have gone from being the, the embodiment of evil and all things wrong mm -hmm. to sexy. sort of evil and all things wrong but alluring and sexy yeah, to more and, more alluring and, sexy. and, and it's, there's something that's going on collectively about the integration of the dark and the unacceptable on, I, I think, I hope that's that's what it's reflective of. Julian, I'm sure you could say more about that, Julian. It's interesting. I've been kind of looking to see, you know, what what sort of like monster lore, you know, is the is the next one because vampires are over, zombies are still sort of around. Um, it's I think right now we're really looking at superheroes archetypally, like in the now, you know, 2018, 2019. Um, that is the the. I understand sort of the collective psyche is really bringing not that they've gone away we've always at least especially in the states we have superhero movies coming out every year you know but this what we're seeing is groups of them the group movies you know the, mm. the getting together that act and realizing we have to have teamwork and it's really less about the single hero I think the single hero idea is actually right now quite dangerous when we look to a single person, that's, that quickly becomes a dictatorship, which frankly is something that we're seeing, uh, you know, happening in, in the now. So uh, just for, you know, away from, you know, looks and image, you know, body image, that it's seeing groups get together, seeing the, the you know, the most recent Star Wars film, they're, they're acting as a group. They realize they need to work together and that that you know, it's always recognized that each one is very, very different from the other, but they're able to get together and work work as a group. They have their individual skills that they bring to things. Um, and then the narrative, too, less with the uh, superheroes, but you do see it um, in some superhero films like Iron Man is what happens when you're defeated? What happens when you you the bad guy does win? And that in the last three years, we've seen more of that, that idea. And again, it's breaking down the hero myth because the hero always wins and you get this group of together and maybe they, maybe they don't, maybe we don't end with that happy ending, but we, there's always a kernel of hope. There's always that plant growing through the sidewalk 
showing us that like, yeah, this is going to be even harder than you imagined <laughs> kind of uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Archetype. Yeah, I think um, I think Game of Thrones was a big introduction to that for a lot of people. Like the Absolutely. Ned head, and that was, I'm sorry if I've just ruined Game of Thrones for anyone who hasn't seen it. The first Spoilers! <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Everyone knows that by now. And then worse things happen too, even worse things. But that was, you know, the hero loses, you know. And... Yeah, but, but then Jon Snow gets brought back. So, you know, we yeah. have our Jesus character. Mm -hmm. And again, yes. that I think that is what, that is what will happen when you have superheroes on like demigods, right? And then you have the next level, which is the, the, the god or goddess type character. And Jon Snow very much is a Jesus character. He is risen from the dead. He is risen from the dead by the power of a witch. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> who, who basically sacrifices, you know, her, essentially herself. Um, you know, she's, she has to go away after that. And, but she does this, you know, resurrection. So the Game of Thrones, I think, is a wonderful way to kind of look at um, collective sort of what's happening the the bigger narratives and the you know this next season and I, I haven't read the book so it's I and mean, evidently it's off off book now but uh, that the idea of you know Daenerys trying to get back to the collective good and the understanding of Jon Snow coming for where he comes from really caring about the larger group of people rather than simply just power um, is is interesting and fascinating and I find hopeful um, mm -hmm. in, in, in a way, uh, you know, those. Yeah, I mean, the big question, and I'll, I'll link this into body image in a second, I promise. But oh, the, big, the big question that um, hangs over the whole thing for me is does it end in a big war with good versus evil where good wins, as in the war of ice and fire, the war against the ice zombies, or is the whole kingdom of Westeros requiring some sort of integration like ice and fire have to be brought into balance some way and i think you saw that when daenerys's dragon went north of the wall set fire to all the ice zombies this is like victory through power mm -hmm. okay and then it doesn't work because the the ice guy's got an ice spear and it, it takes it out so you there needs to be a solution that goes beyond power and dominance mm -hmm. i i hope that's where it's going and uh, just to i, I promise i'll make some to link that in um Going back to what you were saying about the ego and getting rid of the ego, I think, like, as a general comment on um, the way Nicole and I would approach this, uh, we want to go beyond getting rid of any aspect of the self, really, be that the, the ego, the witch, the monster, um, because it's what arises in, in body image where people talk in this very mythical language. They look into magic mirrors, which transform them, even though there's a a wider movement of seeing mental health in a very rational reductionist way about brain chemicals actually people their lived experiences in terms of mythology okay yeah, yeah. transformations into witches and monsters and i want to get away from the witch then to if i can get this witch grab over that and chuck her out whether that's through taking a pill or undergoing some psychotherapeutic process then i'll just feel good but what is the witch what's the power inherent within that witch? if you stop and stop fighting against her and open up lines of communication you might find the bit of, your, of yourself you hate the most is the, the key to your empowerment and transformation. And frequently is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, it's funny, the witch, the archetype of the witch, it's, I haven't really written a great deal about it, especially recently, but the, there's so many ways to look at it. You could do a whole podcast about it, but there's kind of the, uh, the billboard explanation. The witch, the witch in is basically the unowned feminine I think of the witch trials and it is the mm -hmm. patriarchy basically demonizing women and women who have a power that they don't understand. So witches themselves are essentially healers. They're shamans and they're healers. So you can apply those other archetypes to, to the, you know, their, but they also were not, they have the knowledge of the occult, the hidden, you know, they're a priestess in so many ways. And so the, the witch in terms of, um, the witch trials and, and the, the demonization of a witch I means you basically have a doctor, okay? In modern sense, you have a doctor who understands a great deal of things and is there to help people and to cure them. But at a certain point in time, that was threatening to essentially the patriarchy of people who were in charge, and then they must be gotten rid of because the people who were in charge were also very deeply religious, and their way was the only way, so that had to be all shadow. 
you had to burn the witches, you had to get rid of them because it was a huge threat to their power structure. So that's Mm -hmm. in one way. And so you made them ugly, you made them evil, you made them want to eat children and bake them in ovens. And, you know, that's, it's it's so sure, you know, it was a reaction and you created this, the ugly part of an archetype Mm -hmm. and only talked about that and made them the enemy. Um, And I think a little bit more, depending on where you live, that the, the witch still has this immense power, but they really are spiritual people. They are people who are dedicated to do no harm. I mean, that's, that's the, uh, the, the motto of Wiccans of modern Wiccans is do no harm. You know, they, you, you know, you wouldn't do anything to anybody else that you wouldn't want done to yourself. So they're still holding to the, to the golden rule. And we do, we do see, you know, the good witch, It would be nice to eventually just see, you know, the witch as a, you know, she's an embodied human who has flaws, but also is, you know, ultimately dedicated toward, um, you know, connecting with the earth and, and what's magic, you know, magic, however you want to spell it with a CK at the end or, or whatnot, but that's, you know, going back to the Druidic and Celtic roots of that. So there are witches and I think many witches listen to this podcast. (laughs) And I think, if I may say, you know, the way that you're talking there about the witch, and it's so fascinating to listen to you talk about it, you could also think about the the medical model in that way, in terms of uh, psychological distress, which the medical model would kind of label as a psychiatric diagnosis. And you could think about it in terms of, you know, a person experiences um, something, and you could say that that something is a healing something in the same way that the witch is ultimately a healer. So there's this, there's something that occurs within the person that ultimately is trying to bring them back to a remembering of their wholeness. That's, that's its purpose. Um, but it's seen as this shadowy figure because somehow it's taking that, that person outside of the norm or it's causing them to behave in a way that in societal terms seems to be either um, aberrant or unacceptable. Um, so, for example, in my own experience with, you know, the diagnostic label of anorexia, you know, you could see that my um, my my journey into exploring um, how to move beyond my distress was ultimately a, a journey of hope. You know, I was trying to move beyond the difficult experiences I was having. The manifestation of that to the outside eye seemed to be quote unquote evil. You know, so we must get rid of. Um, the anorexia, we must get rid of the bad thing that somehow infiltrated you and, and is, is evil and wrong. Um, but actually, that only seems to take us so far because anything, as Richard was saying, anything we're trying to split off, anything we're trying to say is bad, anything that we're afraid of or demonising, um, you know, is we're, we're disowning a part of ourselves. And so that kind of inviting the psychological distress truly inviting it in truly listening to what it has to say um, removing any sense of demonizing it um, but rather seeing it as a portal into healing and as a portal into hope um, gives a totally different spin on it and and i feel that's where we're a bit stuck currently with the medical model versus other ways of exploring psychological distress and that's but it's also where we're seeing a bit more integration perhaps where we're seeing the medical model merge a little bit and we're seeing practices practices where things like myth are brought into the therapy room but again i think it's a slow a slow process it seems like that um the stories, the mythology live, you know, they live no matter what, and whether Mm. we're using them, whether we're reintegrating them. And again, I think the way you language that is brilliant because at an archetypal level, we're moving more towards inclusivity and that's the, you know, the, the circle, right? So that's, that is in many ways the feminine, but, but I always love the feminine belongs to everyone. It is not Mm. gender related. But in, the, in terms of it's relational, bringing the relational in with the, the agency model, which is the masculine of, you know, diagnose, find, trap, remove. We realize that the, the path of agency, the path of healing has to at some point turn from simply being an arrow moving forward to being a circle and being integrated. And so both are there. We're not, we're not chucking out the model of, um, uh, of healing in terms of, of agency of doing it, but it, it has to include as it grows. And it's that, it's that, you know, the both and model 
where it, where it really is a, a journey of integration and not simply making everything gray. And I think it's, it's incredibly nuanced. And I think as people kind of evolve, we understand that that nuance is important and it's, you know, not simply black and white. It's not simply making everything gray and you get lost in a puddle and everything becomes mixed together, but realizing that these pieces have to, they have to be a part of it. Um, and, and a model of healing and quite, quite frankly, I think how we relate to each other. And again, to bring it back to Game of Thrones, which Richard, we could do an entire podcast on. Yes. Um, is that, <laughs> bring it on. Oh, I know our listeners would like that too. But that idea of, you brought it up brilliantly because it's really easy to see the White Walkers as being, they're the monsters, right? They truly are the monsters. Um, but what were they before they were White Walkers? Hmm. They were humans. They were, you know, humans. all these other, the other creatures. So, and guess what? They've been frozen and they're cold. And, you know, the symbol of that is, you know, there's no life in them. So I just find it really 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 fascinating and i think it would be interesting also with the witch to um to have uh, a further reckoning of i think particularly anglo or white people to understand that we've had witches in our backgrounds you know i live in hawaii where there's healers and there's hawaiian kahus and kahunas who heal and the white people are like oh that's brilliant and i'm like yeah okay well we burnt ours <laughs> back on our <laughs> Oh, laughing, yeah. <laughs> right. So it's just it's it's funny. It's pretty easy to go to you know a Native American healer and honor them, um, and want to learn that. And it's brilliant. I'm not. I'm not certainly not against that and studying shamanism and things like that. But I think for and speaking as an Anglo person myself, um, we you know what is the history of our witches? Everybody had you know indigenous people had healers and many women healers and leaders and all of that so like that history is is contained and some form of internal reckoning or understanding that that we all kind of come from that and then that reowning the witch in so many ways and understanding that a monster is just a projecting out of what is what we want to reject and what we're afraid of. And then so many of the people that we work with, I guess you could say that they're um, projecting that inwards. So they are becoming the witch and they are burning themselves at the stake for it. Mm. They are the monster and they are slaying themselves um, quite literally. Uh, so oh. it's kind of, this, you know, that what, what is within and what is without, it seems to be played out in so many different ways. For a lot yeah. of the people that we work with, it's, it's very much an internalised um, mythological experience and bringing those aspects out into the light if you like looking at them laying them um, before us and, and uh, reflecting upon uh, those different aspects can be really really helpful in, in that road towards the healing and integration yeah oh, that's often wonderful. People who, that is beautifully put yes burning themselves there are there are often people who have a more mythic sense within themselves or a deeper kind of spiritual connection and that's been not valued mm. when they're children it's been, and then they've internalized the voices that don't value it so there's this conflict in them between the, the, the witch the depth the darkness is there but you have a kind of what you say about the patriarchal figure i think of it as like the shadow of the hierophant i really mm -hmm. like the, the the podcast you've done the hierophant julianne um is there and blaming them for that so you have a hierophant in the in the mind the critical voice is pushing that down so it's um really opening up conversations with that critical voice finding out what it is where it's come from and how these two things can exist in balance and indeed i feel it in myself i feel the the dark more out of control part of myself out of control to the rational mind the part it can't understand or get in touch with scares it right and i, I you know it's it's and I can, I can feel that in myself and I can feel myself projecting that out onto other people in my likes and dislikes sense. So it's, it's really about becoming more in touch with that and, and allowing those parts to exist in, in harmony. Important. Well, I love that you guys are doing this, doing this work and um, our participants. So you've got your, it's an online, online groups and do you have people from the States? Do you have people from, are people able to participate from wherever in the world? wherever in the world and we, we we vary the nights so people in different time zones have a chance to attend you know at least some of the time and we do try and put it on weekends because it's in the evening for us so earlier in, in the day for the states right um 
so yeah if anyone i mean that i we do the body image group I, i'm involved in a group around death looking at um like that in the spiritual respect too so if anyone yeah we'll link to the, the information on that and also the study i think that I've, I've got some of the um people's feedback from the study up so any anyone who's interested can look up the kind of shifts that occurred through through doing this work as it's documented now that's brilliant that's lovely um, people are welcome to you know if, if it's right for them they can drop me an email and see about attending any any of the groups Wonderful. Yeah. And I actually, I read a good bit of the, the study. It's, it's fascinating. And I think, I mean, I think part of it too is having, um, having kind of a, a structured form, something that's very, very specific for people to work with these ideas is really important because I think most people walking around who have, I, I don't think I know anybody who doesn't have body issues, um, especially as a woman, um, that, we don't, I, I don't see a lot around specifically addressing the, the, the root issues of it, you know, and, in, 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 you know, the new years, you'll hear all about the latest diet and the latest thing, the, mm-hmm. da, 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 you know, but the, with the, with the real the core issues, the core issues are um, in a, in a spiritual manner. I think that's really important yeah. uh, mm-hmm. to get cut to, and to have, have trusted partners that you're walking, you're walking with. Because again, you you know the parts of the psyche are a bad neighborhood. Don't go alone. You know, <laughs> bring someone who has a flashlight. You know, the flashlight of of spiritual sort of presence to be there with them. I think that's brilliant. When you're talking about people coming together as a group, both currently in um, you know sort of the superheroes journey on on film, um, but also people coming together to have that flashlight to not go it alone, makes me think about the beauty of the groups you know, people come together, they hear each other's stories, they often hear their own thoughts reflected out um, through someone else's voice. And then there is that sense of not being alone, but also that sense of being in community, which is so important. And that's where you get to that deeper level of these struggles where it's not, we're not having, you know, and it's understandable that these conversations happen in the new year and in general around diets and all the rest of it, because it's the capitalist society and the way we're kind of espousing what it is to be Mm -hmm. human on the broader level but then to come together and talk about what that feels like um, and perhaps even to begin to um, put that flashlight on what that might be about in terms of who does that person feel that they are on the deepest level who is what is that true self what is their identity is that the appearance of the body or is that something else and is, is that the struggle is that why this is so painful because the the, the biggest part of them, or if you like, the, the deepest true self part of them knows that that isn't who they are, and yet somehow they keep getting sucked back into it. Um, so I do think it's the beauty of doing this work in groups, in addition to people having those kind of one-to-one experiences as well. Lovely. Well, I think that's, that's a brilliant way to, to wrap things up. So much to think about, and you're right, the, yeah. the beauty of the, of the group um, being together and um, to simply also at that basis point to remind people, you know, where, where they were. I mean, I that can happen in a therapeutic setting, but also in a, you know, in a group setting to, to be able to remind people of who they are when they lose, mm-hmm. when they lose sight of it. And I think good friends can do that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but having it, having it around um, a shared issue, a shared pathology, but also a shared possibility that um, goes beyond, I think, lo- what a lot of other groups um, do around things like eating disorders. They 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 have been very pathological, very like, you know, here are the 12, you know, you go through the 12 steps and all of those things are good, but mm-hmm. they still remain within a, a, a pathology versus simply like one day you will graduate. Like You never graduate from the 12-step group, <laughs> um, but that they're really embracing a, a larger possibility. I think that's great. Thank you both, both very, very much for joining me in your your evening in England and uh, my morning here in Hawaii. Um, mm-hmm. It's been great. Mahalo, as we say here. Oh, thank you. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a great opportunity to talk about this stuff because we don't we don't talk about the missing element. So we, we, we as much we tend to talk about it more from a non dual consciousness only perspective, and it's. it's Fabulous to have the opportunity to speak about the mythic. Hey, happy to. 
We know you could have done something else with the last 45-ish minutes of your life, but we're so glad that you spent with us. Links and more information about Richard and Nicole's work are in the podcast profile, which you can probably see right now on your phone, or you can go to the podcast page for the show. Um, You can also visit deepstateconsciousness.com. And if you'd like to become one of our most favorite people in the whole wide world, become a patron. Just visit tiny.cc slash tarot, and you too can be like these awesome humans, Sarah, Geneva, Richard, Peter, Rash, Ali, and Yvonne. Thank you. Your support makes all of this happen, and you make us smile every day. The show is produced by Both and Media, and the theme music is by The Lunar Group.